there, folks. It's Nathan again, doing another quickie video. Uh, this time I am doing some acrylic painting on an MDF board that I prepped earlier. Um, I'm going to have a video up showing how I prepped this. Uh, basically, I just drew on it with color pencil, then graphite, and then to seal the pencils in, I used um, acrylic medium, just matte medium. Uh, water down a little bit so I can smooth it evenly on here. This MDF cardboard, whatever, is uh, it's just compressed wood uh, with resin pulling it together. Should be fairly safe as far as archival goes, but I'm sealing it all the way around, so it doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, this isn't supposed to be archival work anyway, but it should be okay. Um, I've heard that MDF used to have chemicals in it that would go acidic over time, but this should be fine. This is relatively brand new stuff, and I don't think they use the acidic stuff anymore. At any rate, this is just a test. It is, however, really porous when you get it. It's almost like a like chipboard, like a really thick chipboard. So it's it's very porous. So what I've done is with the ceiling, a couple of sealant levels and uh, some sanding, is I have turned it back into a smoother surface. Theoretically, we're about to find out. It feels much smoother to the touch. I am trying out some new paint today too. Some. Joe Sonia, which apparently is a decent brand here in Australia. Um, I'm not a big deal with brands, really. I don't have any preferences or anything. I'm trying to get a really light kind of acrylic wash layer going on, just to add a little color. So this is the raw sienna. I've also got some burnt sienna I want to put in after. Let's see if I can keep the graphite showing through. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. This will all be tones of brown, obviously, because it's uh, burnt and raw sienna on top of brown wood, so. I don't have a huge plan here. This is all just sort of an abstract test kind of image, but I thought it was kind of cool looking. Maybe all I'll do is just paint strokes in. On top of lines. Find the form a little bit. There's not a lot of form there to the side, but leave a little bit of the wood showing through. Highlight. Technically speaking, this would be my mid tone, I guess. Back to using the uh, SLR camera. You probably noticed that last video with the Gatorman sketch was really bad. I was using a little action camera that I got a long time ago. Just trying it out. It, apparently, it needs full light full sunlight to have any kind of decent production value, and the mic on it is ridiculous. So um, apologies for that. That was not a very good video. Hopefully somebody was able to see something. <laughs> At the very least, I was able to uh, test it out and see that it's not suitable for this. Maybe if I paint outside at some point, or if I wanted to uh, do a, a talking head thing outside, I might go back to using that, but it's not going to not going to work for the studio. And it, like this, also had a 30 minute limit. So if for some reason this cuts off abruptly, that's why. I'm trying to be better timing it. I don't want to do 30 minute videos, quite frankly. It's too long. So I'll just try to get through this test. I've done, the second one of these I've done, which I just shot a few minutes ago, uh, myself sort of prepping it. So you can see the process that happens before this. I did a little bit more with the color pencil first, because I do color pencil and then I go back in with graphite for the details. And the color pencil in the second one is a lot more tony. So it's almost like that's the underpainting. And then this becomes the uh, first layer of real painting. But I'm still just using Sienna here for testing. Because I kind of like the look of it, the tone of it. I think the medium's holding up pretty well here. So the brush is gliding across nicely. It's not dry brushing on me at all. It's not choking out. It's good. The paint's very nice too. I hadn't, I've never used this brand of paint before, like I said, and it's, it's highly recommended. It's one of the more expensive acrylics that I've found here, at least in the crafts level. There are some really good uh, high-end imported like German and Dutch and English acrylics here. That are supposedly great, but until I start making stuff that I plan on making a lot of money on, I think it's better to work on the cheap stuff. That way I don't feel so bad when I mess something up. 
<laughs> well, theoretically, anyway. I feel still feel pretty bad when I'm messing it up. But... Anyway, this pattern here is just an idea to have some texture. I just wanted to do like a, a threatening kind of Grim reaper type thing and have some texture flowing around. And since this is washes I'm doing, I'm going to try some opaque here. Go solid with it. It's pretty good coverage. Yeah, definitely the finish on this is way better than the raw NBF. You can paint on the raw NBF, but until you put down two or three coats, it's uh, it just soaks it right up. It makes it look like ink on paper, which is an interesting effect if that's what you're going for, but you can waste a lot of paint that way. <laughs> Especially if you're trying to mix colors at the time, it's kind of frustrating. Trying to blend colors in on top of it just vanishing. I've been inspired a lot lately by uh, YouTube video stuff. I've been watching, I watch a lot of YouTube tutorials and videos and podcasts or whatnot. Um, one Fantastic Week is one of my favorite ones. I've mentioned that a few times before here on my YouTube channel. Those guys are great. I'll link them downstairs in the uh, show notes there. Um, if you haven't seen them and you're interested at all in the life and working business of a uh, fantasy illustrator or artist in general, definitely check it out. It's really good stuff. They do lots of cool interviews with industry pros, some of my favorite people, some of the people I really look up to. They are some of the people I really look up to, too. Uh, Sam Flegel does a lot of great sort of Norse mythology type stuff. He's got a great aesthetic. He's from my part of the U.S. too. It's kind of nice hearing an accent that I recognize. <laughs> Living in Sydney, it's not very common I hear Southern American accents, except as a parody. You just have to kind of grin and bear it. And uh, Pete Moorbacher is the other host. He does a great series. He's working on a series of his own IP right now called Angelarium, which is really cool looking. These sort of um, quasi-humanoid divine being kind of things. I'm not sure about the story so much, but the art is incredible. They're both great artists. It really is it's good to see their work. And not only that, but the show is about like the behind-the-scenes thing, like how everything works and how they run their business and how they do shows. And They interview lots of, like I said, lots of great industry people. So it's a lot of fun. Definitely worth tuning in. And it's just great to listen to while you're working. I learned a lot from them. Uh, but the interviews with, their, with the guests are some of the ones that, the things that led me to try this technique. Um, I cannot remember the guest, and I am very sorry for that, but I'll put the link in it below. Um, I couldn't remember a minute ago when I shot the video of me prepping this thing either. But um, she is an amazing artist, and she does this really great sort of pencil-based, uh, soft, soft color, soft focus-y kind of, I don't know what you call it, mixed media, I suppose, because there's, there's acrylic underpainting, there's oil overpainting, you can still see the pencils all the way through it, too. So it's just got this really nice, warm feeling to it. Um, God, I wish I could remember her name. I feel really bad about that. I just watched it again today, too. But uh, she mentions a technique like this, where she seals the pencils in on paper, and then mounts the paper onto board with uh, matte medium, which she got from uh, Gene Cola, who is another great artist. That I think they've interviewed him too. He's an amazing artist. He's he's probably better than I will ever be. <laughs> it's one of those people you're like, man, that's really good. I'm not even gonna try that. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to, but it's just I got a feeling it'd be just disappointing. Um, I know you're not supposed to compare yourself to other artists, but damn, he's good. He's, he's good like in a classical art sense, like a renaissance painter would be. Just It's, it's a, a different level of professionalism than I am used to for myself. And it's inspiring. It's, it's, I know it sounds like I just was like bummed out because he's so great and I'll never be that good, but in addition to that, it's also really inspiring that someone uh, is working in a field I want to work in and also has all that classical sort of, I don't know, cachet. Because I really love the classical art stuff, and I'd love to reconcile my love of that with, you know, freaking monsters and 
zombies and stuff like that. If Ruben's ever painted zombies, that would be <laughs> that'd be what who I want to be. Um, or rock monsters, which is my favorite, my favorite thing to do. Anyway, but instead of mounting it on the board, doing it on paper and then mounting sealing the paper and mounting that on board, I just started thought I'd do the drawing directly on the board and see about sealing it on there and just painting directly on. I had no problem with that. Actually, I kind of like the I like the color of the board a lot, so that worked out for me. It's super thick, as I probably sh I've shown you guys already. It's it's quite thick, so it's not going to warp no matter how much you put on it. I'm not sure you can catch that highlight, but this acrylic's drying really fast. Maybe the medium's not sealing it completely, but it feels really smooth when it goes on. So I'm all for that. Um, I don't usually glaze paintings. I, I seal them at the end with a a varnish. I guess you don't generally varnish acrylics, but I'm thinking about trying something else too. I want to sort of separate the, uh, the skull elements from the swirly non-element elements. And I think that one way to do that really subtly and nicely would be to uh, use uh, gloss varnish on one and matte varnish on the rest. For instance, gloss varnish on the skull and hands, of all things, and then matte varnish on the rest of the painting. I think that would be kind of cool because it would be something you wouldn't really notice until you kind of watched it change through the light. It would be nice and subtle, you know? Subtlety seems to be something I'm really interested in lately, and it's something I've never been very good at. I find that most of the professional work I really admire, the parts that I admire about it that I don't see in my own work, are generally involving subtlety. It's a little bit heavy on that burnt sienna. It's so red. <laughs> okay. I will be putting a glaze on this too, just to, uh, it's too much water. Either, if, even if I don't decide to do the uh, mixed glazes, uh, varnish, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a varnish on it at the end just because I want to sort of harmonize the colors. So once this basic color work underpainting thing I'm doing dries, which at this rate will be before I'm done talking. Um, I can go over a whole thing with glazes and just put highlights and stuff in there like that. And if you keep it watery enough, apparently it still blends in with the background. That's really nice. That artist I mentioned before that I can't remember her name, she also uses acrylic ink instead of acrylic paint. And I'm thinking that's my, that may, might be part of the reason she's able to get such nice blends. Because if it's really loose, like this is, then you'll get uh, kind of a subtle, almost watercolory effect out of it. Because this this Rossian is not wet at all. I mean, it's dry, it's completely dry. But maybe the matte varnish is keeping it from sinking in enough that I can still access the pigment a little bit with the water in the burnt sienna. I probably should have gotten umbers instead of siennas for this. It would have looked a little better with browns instead of reds, but it still looks like what I was thinking about anyway. One thing I really love about acrylics, and I think most people would agree with this, is that um, their, their greatest strength is, is I mean, their greatest weakness is also their greatest strength. Uh, their greatest weakness is that it's hard to work them together because as soon as you stop moving it around, and sometimes even before that, it dries and you're stuck. You know, you, you sort of have to, whatever you got is what you got. I am liking this transparency. I still see my pencils through there. I still see my values. Nice. Uh, but that also is a great strength because if you do subtle little layers like this, you can go right back in and darken it, right on top of what you just did without waiting for any drying. If you tried that with oils, you'd end up just sort of adding the colors together. And in my case, the one time I've tried oils, smearing it around and making a huge mess, like a big muddy mess out of it. Another good thing about being wet and soft on this board is I can 
use the pad of my finger as a smudge tool and sort of a sponge to kind of soak up any excess. That's pretty cool. I wanted the hands to kind of feel like they were part of the, uh, I don't know what you call this stuff, fog, mist. Not only are they coming out of it, but they're sort of out of it, like made of it. So having that, that more uh, burnt sienna in here. Some uh, little pieces of it here and there. Just in the shadows might be good. Kind of blend it back in. It does make the hands stick out slightly less, but uh, I think I can live with that. Again, the thin washes, that's the way to go. I usually don't use acrylics like this, which is probably why my acrylics are usually so uh, heavy handed looking. Gene Tola said on his website that he does opaques first and then transparent washes over those. So he does like his, almost like a silhouette, I'm guessing. And then like highlights and tone and stuff on top of them with transparents. Which is a really cool way to do it. I'm trying to do just trans, I've already got my tones in place with pencils and everything, so I'm just trying to do transparency over that. Keep it as long as possible and as strong as possible. subtle up some of these bizarre bones. It's not a very accurate skull, skull hit, but again it's floating in a mist cloud with its big claws, so I guess it doesn't have to be very accurate. wonder how soon after I post this will someone say Red Skull? <laughs> One of my favorite villains, but not what I was intending here. Sorry. Sorry to deceive you folks. Right, I'm just going to mix a little bit of this together. Burnt and raw sienna. I'm not sure why it's already got mixed on the palette here, but kind of a subtlety, yeah. Good for combining. This whole thing was pretty much just an exercise in materials and tone and brush control little I have. Um, I'm not quite advanced enough yet to be worrying about lost and found edges and stuff like that, but I really like the way the uh, paint obs just barely obscuring my little hatching shadows here on the edges acts like kind of a lost edge. I like that. I have this come around behind the thumb. Yeah, I like that better. This is almost pure abstraction here because the only thing representational is the skull and the claws are even more abstract than the skull. The skull's pretty bad, right? But the background is really loose and like imaginary. It's like a metaphorical kind of background. And again, it's just so I can play with shapes. I wanted folds and things I can put shadows in. people watching are looking at my brush technique going, good god, <laughs> you're not even holding it right. That's right, I'm not. Um, I have been trying to transition more to an artist group when I draw, uh, to draw from the shoulder more, but for something this small, this kind of brush control and stuff that I need, I need to stay with the grip I'm, I'm used to and just go more from the wrist or even the fingers. I'm just not quite steady enough yet, with a brush at least, to pull off the artist grip with any kind of control. I think it's okay to do it this way. I'm not going to get repetitive stress injury from doing this for 10 minutes or whatever it is. It's a bad habit, but it's a small piece. And I think small pieces you have to do some kind of a little more control stuff. So if this, I treat this as an underpainting just for color. I'm probably going to go back in with, uh, I might go one shade darker in the darks. I might go ahead and get that umber out. And um, then 
I need some highlights. I said how strong the highlights should be. The darks are not going to be that dark. I really just want to use the highlights to point out the separations. Anyway, that was enough of a test for you guys to see what's going on. I don't want to overload the uh, camera and I don't want to have a 20 minute video to edit. Although I may have already broken that. So, thanks for watching as always. I hope this was better lit and sounded better this time. Uh, as always, you guys, thanks for everything you do. Thanks for spreading the word on the videos. Thanks for liking, subscribing. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have questions and some comments or anything that you're my way. Um, I'll be doing a few more of these. Uh, I'll be finishing up the other one I, that I filled myself uh, sealing a few minutes ago. I've also got some other painting projects in the works. I'm going to finish up the uh, gouache rhino monster. Rhino man, I guess you call it. Rhino warrior. Got to finish up some spots in here and then go back over the whole thing uh, for detail pass. But yeah, that'll be probably the next big thing and a few more of these things in between. And I might even do a speed painting of me finishing this one, but it won't be commentary or anything on that one because it's, there's not much more to say. You've seen the technique. Uh, so again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, keep making stuff.